We've been in a series of messages that we've been looking at that's really about change. It's a series of messages that, that is entitled simply Reset. And uh, what we've hoped to do is, as we talk to you each week, is to encourage each of you to kind of hit the reset button in your life. To, to kind of go back to square one. And, and many times we, we live day to day and we kind of lose out on the focus of, of what God's called us to and how he wants us to live. And this is a series really for those who are serving Jesus and, and uh, those who have just started and, and those who have been serving him a long time. And we're asking you to consider hitting the reset button in your life and, and experiencing that change all over again, beginning to live your life the way God intended. We've talked about how we think, We've talked about uh, kind of uh, finding again that, that cause that moves us in service. We've talked about how we grow in faith. We've talked about a lot of things. This morning, I want to talk to you simply about one word, and it's remain. 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 God's plan, His destiny for us, as we've noted earlier in this series, is that we would excel, that we would that we would run the race He's put before us with excellence, that we would achieve great things, that we would have in, in many ways, many tangible as well as non-tangible ways, that we would experience the, the wonder of His provision and abundance in our lives. And this is, this, I'm not talking about resources of money. I'm talking about abundance of joy, abundance of peace, abundance of hope, abundance of, of life, abundance of enthusiasm and His blessing and His favor. In John 10.10, 10, He kind of proclaims this grand purpose when He says, I have come that they may have life. He's talking about you and me, that we may have life and have it abundantly, abundantly. I was thinking about that over the last few weeks. If I were to try to boil all of that down, what does it mean to have a life of abundance? What, what does that look like? If I could boil that down to one word, I think it would be the word thrive. Thrive. I want a life that thrives, a, a life that, that lives at the highest level. Unfortunately, I see a lot of people, believers included, who live their lives and they're barely surviving, much less thriving. You know what I'm talking about? They just kind of go through the motions and they may have committed their life to Jesus and experienced the forgiveness of their sin, but, but they've seemed to have kind of hit a, a, a wall in their life and they're, they're, they're beat up with, with, with sadness and with defeat and depression and, and despair. And, and it seems like their lives are, are really just falling apart rather than coming together. It seems so different than a life that thrives, but a life that thrives is one that's in the that's functioning in the abundance and the bounty of, of God's goodness. It's, it's a life where we're living to the fullest. We're finding meaning and purpose. We're discovering a reason really to get out of bed in the morning. We get out of bed with joy and hope and, and, and peace and enthusiasm. And that's thriving. That's the dream that Jesus has for each of you, every one of you, that you would live your life in such a way that, that you're not living under the circumstances, but you're living above them because Christ is in you. Can you say amen to that? That's the kind of life that he longs for you to have. As I was preparing this message, I ran across a, um, a set of initials that, in a sense, look like something that someone might use as a shorthand in their text. Someone might use in, in, in just trying to communicate something over the phone real quick, but it's, it's something much more serious than that. These three initials, FTT, stand for something far greater. It's, it's used in the medical field. In fact, it's, it's typically used in the pediatric section of the hospital, the, pre, uh, the, the neonatal or the, the, uh, the, the ICU for the, the NIC unit, the, 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 the newborns. And, and it's, a, it's a really sad, sad assessment. It's, it's written on charts Day in and day out, it, it's, it's a fairly new, uh, new statement, but it's used quite a bit, FTT. How many of you have heard of FTT before? Just a, a couple of you. FTT, at its core, it simply means failure to thrive. What happens is a doctor or a nurse or a physician will come through and they'll begin to care for a child. And, and over time, it looks like this child should be healthy. It looks like the child should, should be taking in uh, nutrients and growing strong and, and uh, meeting all of the, the marks of, 
of maturity and its, its process of aging, but, but for some reason an infant or a child, a newborn, will just struggle and, and will we'll cease to have any energy and will sleep all the time and they become weakened, they become limp, they, they, they don't grow, there's, there's not the maturing as, as they anticipate. And so when a doctor or a physician isn't really sure what's going on, but they know that there's something struggle or something bad happening to this child, they'll simply write on their chart, FTT. This child is experiencing a, a failure to thrive. You know, it happens for a lot of reasons. Sometimes it happens because a, a newborn will experience something in the, the process of its, its um, uh, growth during the nine months in the, the womb of the mom. Maybe it, it, there's something that's, that's um, transferred health-wise that, that causes the child to struggle. Maybe an addiction, maybe a, um, uh, some type of disease or something that they've not nailed down yet. Sometimes, though, an FTT uh, uh, assessment is given, though, simply because a child is, is just beginning to, to take on the environment in which it lives. And maybe a mother or a father is heavily depressed or, or dealing with great despair themselves, and the emotional state begins to pass on to the child and the pediatrician, the, the, the pediatric ward, the, the nurse, the doctor. They don't know what's going on, just that there's a, a failure to thrive. Sometimes it has to do with metabolism and growth stages, but at any rate, it's a diagnosis. It sounds like an explanation, but it really doesn't state anything at all. Just that this baby's not doing well. FTT, a failure to thrive. And as I was thinking about this, I was just stirred with the thought that this sounds like the, the, the diagnosis for much of humanity, that our world seems to, to be failing to thrive. Even within the church, even believers sometimes failing to thrive. And we can't really put our finger on a specific issue. It just seems like there's not life there. There's a lack of, of growth. There's, there's a, 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 an assessment that says something's off, but I just can't pinpoint it. Maybe some of you have experienced that. Maybe some of you are going through it now. Many of us have. At some point in life, most of us possibly will. When we fail to thrive, maybe it's because of some struggle or a sin issue or a failure, some deep regret that's bombarding your thoughts. Maybe it's, maybe it's because of a tragedy or a grief that has broken your heart. It's kind of worn you down. Maybe it's because of an issue that has arised in, uh, arisen in life and it's just causing you pain. It's tiring you out. It's, it, it's wearing you down. It feels like the world's problems are resting on your shoulders and you just can't see a way out. If you're in that place, maybe you feel like you're a living example of failing to thrive. But if that's the case, this is a good day for you because you're in the right place to find the answer to that problem in life. Jesus talks about that. He says, I want you to thrive. I want you to live a life of abundance. I want you to experience my blessing and favor and my goodness. But if you're experiencing something else, I think I've got the answer for you. In John chapter 15, Jesus speaks to his disciples. And this is the, the place where we find in John the, the seventh time he identifies himself as God, the great I am. And here he refers to himself as the one really who answers the question that all of the Old Testament is asking. Who is God going to send and when will God come near? And he says, really, I am the one that you've been waiting on. I am the answer. I'm the, I'm the resolution to the problem that exists within humanity. And he talks to his close companions and he draws them in and he shares an illustration that they would have understood readily. I think it's something that you'll get to. It's, it's where he talks about a vine and a branch and fruit. You know, I have a, I have a, a, a vine in my backyard some muscadines that I planted several years ago. And every year they get bigger. I prune them back and they grow bigger and bigger. This year, every year I have to restake them out too. And this year they're taking over the entire left side of my yard. They're just massive. My wife and a friend looked at them this past week and gave me the assessment that they need to go, that there's a problem. They need to be trimmed way back. And I said, why? She said, because it is like a safe haven for snakes. Get it out. These are my grapes. 
These are the fruit of the vine. This is biblical. This is godly, lady. Don't you get that? She says, they got to go. I went out. I had pressed and lifted them all up one by one. We mowed underneath every area of it. We weeded it and trimmed. We got it to where it's beautiful. It's this perfect vine that's reaching from the glories of heaven all the way to the ground, and it's just weighted down with the fruit of God's blessing. And yet she still says they got to go. We're debating that. Just stay posted. I'll, I'll let you know how that goes. But I didn't want to bring those in because they're not quite ripe yet. But I brought these grapes just to signify what it looks like for a life that's producing good fruit, a life that's fruitful. Jesus is talking about this. And if you've got your copy of the Scriptures, look at it with me. John chapter 15 and verse 1. Jesus says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. And he cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Let me just pause and say, Jesus is talking to believers. He's talking to his group, these who have walked with him. They've experienced the goodness of, of Christ in their lives like many of you have. And yet these words to them, I think, also stand as words to you. Verse 3, he says, remain in me. Say that word with me, remain. Remain. Say it again with some conviction. You ready? Remain. He says, remain in me. Now, over the next several verses, he says the word remain 11 times. You know, in the, the, the text of Scripture, as John is writing this out, John can't highlight if you look at my notes, I've, I've highlighted all kinds of stuff. I've underlined things. I've circled things that I want to stress. John was at a disadvantage. He couldn't do that. The only way to, to stress something was for the Holy Spirit to emphasize it again and again. And I'm going to tell you, Jesus is teaching here, and he's using this word remain over and over again. He uses it 11 times in one short paragraph because he wants you to get this. This is important for you. You and I must learn to remain in Jesus. Remain in Jesus. Look at verse 3. He says, remain in me, and I also as I also remain in you. For no branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain, it must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. Verse 5, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you're like a branch that's thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire and burned. He's saying there's no point to this kind of life. But he says in verse 7, if you remain in me and my words remain in you, then ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourself to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so, I have, loved, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and, and remain in his love. I have told you this. If you've got your copy of the Scripture, you may want to highlight it or underline it or circle it. Here's the point. He says, I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. Jesus relates this story to stress to you the idea of His presence in your life and His strength with you, His joy in you, His hope in you, His, his faith his, his confidence, his, his trust as he has in the Father that you might have it in him. He says everyone, in, everyone needs to have this kind of experience that they might bear fruit, that they might produce good fruit. This, according to Jesus, is the image of a life, a picture well-lived, one that thrives. This morning, I want you to learn how to do that. If you boil all this down, you find that the main thing Jesus is stressing here is this idea of you remaining in him. You remaining in Him. I want you to remain in Him. He says the life that, re that is remaining or abiding in Him is one of constants. It's, it's one of, of commitment. It's one of dedication. It's one of, of community. It's one of faithfulness. It's one where, where He's known and, and He knows you. It's one of pursuit. You know, I, I struggled this week because it... You know, typically preachers like to bring points 
to you. They like to bring, bring out big ideas and, and try, to, try to correlate them in a way that you can walk away with and, and kind of think on later. And, and i got to tell you, there's just one point here. There's one big idea. There's one major emphasis, and it is you have to remain in Jesus if you want to bear fruit. You have to remain in Jesus if you want to experience joy. You have to remain in Jesus if you want anything good in life to ever come your way. It's all dependent upon your relationship with him. For everything good comes from the hand of the Father as the gardener and Jesus as that great vine. And if you stay tied into him, then if you remain in him, then you experience all of that. But if you distance yourself, then your life will end up being described by words like depression and despair and depletion. Difficulty, defeat, distraction. He says, remain in me. Throughout his, his teaching here in these verses, he says, it's important that you remain. Remain in me. What does that look like? He says, well, it, it, it's, it's you staying committed to my word. Remaining in my word. In fact, he links your commitment to staying tied close to him with the production of of godly power coming through your life. He says, if you remain in me and my word in you, if my word is in you, if my word is deeply rooted in you, he says, then you can ask for anything you want and it shall be done. And you know, through the years I've read this and there are moments in life where as I read it, I expect God to qualify it. I expect Jesus to say something like, remain in me, and my word's in you, and you can ask for anything you want, and it shall be done for you. Unless, of course, you're too young, and you haven't had enough experience. Unless, of course, you're too old, and you don't have enough energy. Unless, of course, you've stumbled in life, and you've had a problem. Unless, of course, you've given in to temptation, and you've experienced a problem in your life that is is only able to be dealt with by me. Unless you've, unless you've walked a perfect life, you can't really do this. But he doesn't qualify it like that. You know what his qualifier is? Remain in me. Just remain in me. There seems to be, while he does all the saving and we do all the submitting to him, there seems to be this idea that once you've experienced faith in Jesus, that there is a responsibility on your part. And it is not to be distracted by the things of this world, but to pursue Jesus with all of your heart. Let me, let me share it like this. A number of years ago, I met this red-haired girl. Now, I like to tell the story a different way. I like to tell it how she saw me across the campus and she tripped over herself running to me. It's an incredible story. It's a beautiful story. It's a made-up story, but, but it's, it's one I like to tell. But the truth is I saw her. I came in. I sat down at a table to eat lunch. She had been just a, a couple people ahead of me, and I would kind of followed her. I wasn't stalking her, but kind of. I don't know. And I, I followed her to a table, and she sat down over here, and I saw a friend of mine at that table, so I sat down at the same table, and I was like, hey, Ralph, how you doing? And I was really looking at Lori. And uh, I talked with them, and I hung out, and we ate our lunch, and she got up and slipped away, and I leaned over to him. I said, now that's the kind of girl right there that I want to know. I want to date her. That's the kind of girl. That's the kind of girl. I didn't know a lot about her. I just saw her character as it was displayed in that community that day. But I said, that's the kind of girl. And i just tell you right now, I came face-to-face with a mission. I was given a divine purpose, and it was to pursue this girl. And I, I just... I took the impossible mission, and I, and I did it. I pursued her every day. I walked her to classes. I was late to classes because I was carrying her books to her class. I was asking her out every time I got a chance. And she would say things like this to me. She'd say, well, if you want to see me, I'll be in the library. I wasn't sure what that building was, and I really didn't know where it was, but I made it my mission to find it. And there I sat across from her at a table. She was on this side. I was on this side. She was studying. I was studying her. And and look, I was just fulfilling my mission. And there was a woman that worked in that place named Miss Parent at the time. And she continued to walk by because I couldn't be quiet. 
I know that shocks you, but I couldn't. I couldn't be quiet. And I was watching her, and I would talk to her, and she'd come and she'd go, shh, I trust this will be short. And I was like on the inside going, I hope it is not short. I hope this conversation lasts a lifetime. I was pursuing her. Long story short, we married. We're approaching now 24 years. August will be 24 years. On the day we married, if I would have at that point said, all right, all right, she married me. It's good. I got what I wanted. It's a done deal. And from that point on, begin to just distance myself from her. Do you think there would have been a problem with that? Listen, you don't want to make a redhead mad. I'm just telling you. I determined at that point, the pursuit wasn't over. In fact, the pursuit still isn't over. I still pursue her. My kids get so embarrassed when we're at home and I'm pursuing her. And I do it in part to embarrass them because that's the role of a parent, right? To embarrass your kids. So I do that. But I still pursue her every moment of my life. The moment I stop pursuing her begins the moment our relationship and our love grows distant and cold. Look, I don't know where you're at in life, but when it comes to your experience with Jesus, it's the same way. He says, you need to remain in me and I in you. You need to remain committed to my word. And, and when you do, everything that you ask for, everything you ask for shall be. I, I will answer your prayers, he's saying. I will give you the power that you need to live. But it comes to this idea of pursuit, pursuing him. You know, there's sometimes I think it's a, probably a qualifier that, that Jesus wanted to say there where he says, if you... Ask anything you will. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be given to you. And I expect him to say, now I'm just speaking in kind of rhetorical illustration here. This is not really meant for reality. I'm just trying to exaggerate a point. But that's not what he's doing. He's saying everything that you have need of in life, you can boldly come to him when you're remaining in him and in his love and in his word. And you can ask him and everything you have need of, he will be the supplier of it. It's a great story that I ran across some time ago. And it's a a story of of, uh, of really it looked like failure. In in 1986, it seemed like the world was going to crash in around this man named David Green. Anybody ever heard of David Green? David Green was uh, a businessman. He was in Oklahoma. He had, he had been contacted by his bank, and they were about to foreclose on a struggling, struggling business, this business known as Hobby Lobby. Anybody heard of Hobby Lobby before? It started in 1973 during the oil boom in Oklahoma, and, and everything was going great. But, but at one point, the oil business dried up, and when they did, banks began to struggle, and banks wanted to call in every loan that they had made, and one of them was to David Green and Hobby Lobby. And they didn't have the money. They didn't know what they were going to do. But they were a believing family. They were a Christian family. And this father said, we're going to stand together and we're going to trust God. We're going to remain trusting in Christ. We're going to remain faithful to Him. We're going to remain in His Word. And we're going to ask God to do some great things. As he tells a story, he would go into his office and he would climb underneath his desk. This is a CEO, a businessman. He'd climb underneath his desk and he would make that space under his desk like a prayer closet. And he would just weep before the Lord and say, God, I don't have the answer. I can't do this. But I trust you. God, I need you. The end of the story is that God answered his prayer. God came through. God blessed his business. They didn't foreclose. He was able to crawl out from under that desk after time and experience the very answer to the prayers he'd been praying. They witnessed as God came through. And, and today they're quick still to give God credit for all of that, for pulling their company out of uh, the potential of bankruptcy. Today Hobby Lobby has roughly 350 stores in more than 38 states across the nation. They annually clear, clear somewhere north of $1.5 billion, with a B, dollars. David Green is on Forbes' list of the the wealthiest of Americans, the top 400 wealthiest Americans. And their purpose statement in Hobby Lobby still says this in part. Part of it reads, we believe that it is by God's grace and His provision alone that Hobby Lobby has endured. For He, God, has been faithful to us in the past and we trust Him for our future. That's a picture of remaining. That's what happens. When you remain, God begins to bless your life and gives you favor. 
God cares for you. Don't walk out of here thinking that I'm saying you serve God and God's going to give you five, $1.5 billion in your bank account. This is not about resources and money. It's about the resource of God being your caregiver. Look, for you, blessing may look different. For you, it may be an intimate, close relationship with your children. For you, blessing may be that you have a job when others are struggling to have one. For you, blessing may be that you have food to put on your table in a time when when it is hard, still following post-recession here in the U.S. For you, blessing may be that you have peace even in the midst of a health struggle within your family. For you, blessing may look so different than it did for David Green. It is not about the tangible stuff. It is about the spiritual things. And God says, if you remain in me and I in you, then you can ask me for anything and it shall be. God will come through. God will come through. You know, one last thing I I guess I want to say is, God then says, when you do this, I will will make you bountiful. There will be much fruit produced. I've heard this preached many times in many ways. and Sometimes people leave with the feeling like, well, if I'm going to remain in Christ and I've got to do a lot of stuff, I've got to go and check a lot of boxes. I've got to start, I've got to start working harder. I've got to work more. I've got, to, I've got to produce fruit. You know, I've never seen, I've never seen a, a grapevine or a peach tree or an apple tree or a, a blueberry bush, I've never seen any of them strive to produce fruit. I've seen some that didn't produce good fruit, some that didn't produce any fruit, but I've never seen any of those strive to produce fruit. You know why? It's not the job of the bush or the tree or the vine to produce fruit. It's God's job to produce fruit. I've never seen an apple tree going, ugh. Apple, it doesn't happen that way. It doesn't. Apple trees don't produce apples. God produces apples in apple trees and through them. In the same way, God produces good fruit. Come on, move on. God produces good. Some of you are like, he's got issues. Yeah, he does. He does. But that's a whole nother day. It is God's, it is God's joy as you remain in him to be the gardener, to produce good fruit in you. Good fruit. The fruit of His presence. The fruit of His Spirit. The fruit like peace, like patience, like power and authority, like confidence, like faith, like joy. Not just the the fruit that, that Paul would write about, but even more. There are so many things that God wants to do in and through you. And you know what? As you remain in Him, He's the one who's faithful to produce that. You, your responsibility is simply to remain faithful. I, I, I thought about it this week. I thought about it like this. God's goal for you is not that you will do more for Him, but simply that you will choose to be more with Him. To be more with Him. You want to be a blessing to God and a blessing to others? Spend time in His presence. Take time You take time to read God's Word. You take time to to understand it. You take time to pray for the Holy Spirit to to, to work it out in you. You take the time. You dedicate the time to be with Him, and I guarantee you, He will be with you. When it comes to you hitting the reset button in your life and learning to remain, it is all about you submitting yourself to Him. So let me say this to you. If you're feeling depleted, if you're feeling despair, if you're feeling discouragement, if you're feeling defeat, if you're feeling disabled, if you're feeling dissatisfied or diswanted, if you feel like any of that stuff today, the answer for you is the same as it was for the disciples on that day. It's time for you and I to remain in Jesus. Remain in Him. Just submit yourself to Him. Say, Lord, I want more of you today. I thank you that you sang so passionately during our worship time of of singing and you said, set a fire within my soul. Something that you, you said that, that, that would never burn out, that would never go out. In that same way, he says to you, I'll do it as you keep asking. You keep, you keep submitting yourself to me and I'll keep doing the work in you. It's, it's what Wesley really said in his three rules for, for living. John Wesley said this. He said, number one, do no harm. Number two, do all the good you can. 
And number three, continue to pursue your love in Christ. Do no harm, do good, and love Jesus more every day. That, my friend, is a picture of remaining.